It is that time of year again. The days are slowly but surely getting shorter. The temperature is slowly but surely starting to cool off more and more. And before we know it, the leaves will start changing colors. That's right, folks. Fall is in the air. It's coming soon. And with the coming of fall is what many consider one of their most favorite holidays of the year. Halloween. And of course, with Halloween comes some of my favorite things of all time. Horror movies. In this series, I'm going to share with you some of the movies that I consider to be foundational to my lifelong love of horror. Now, some of these movies are going to be older than some of you even listening to this show. <laughs> and that's okay. Just remember, these are the movies that lit that spark in me to love horror. Welcome to my horror history. Welcome to Voluntary Input. Hey guys, welcome to chapter two of my horror history in a, a series in which I talk to you about some of the horror movies that I feel set the foundation for my love of horror. Now, last week I talked to you about one of the first movies. If, if I'm not mistaken, it was the first horror movie I ever saw that really set the love affair in motion. And that was the omen and subsequently the other two chapters that followed. Now this week, I want to talk to you about a movie that pretty much shook me up at the time that I saw it. If you remember in the last episode, I talked to you about how there are different things that scare people, uh, different things scare different people and different things scare people in different ways. You know, I touched on, you know, how a lot of horror movies that deal with religion tend to freak me out. Uh, some people also get freaked out and about, uh, you know, the paranormal or in, in some, some people, they get freaked out by slasher movies. You know, those are their favorite kind of horror movies because they scare them. But in the same time, you know, in the same vein, it also entertains them. This week, I'm going to talk to you about, like I said, a movie that's kind of in that slasher uh, genre you know, that slasher area of the genre, because typically I don't really care for slasher movies. It's it, uh, to me, they're just not, I don't know. They just don't really, they don't really shake me up as much, but this one is considered one of the classics of slasher horror, even though I don't really put it so much into that slasher category. I don't know. It's just me. I guess I'm just a little weird, but in either case, like I said, a lot of faith-based horror movies tend to you know they they, they kind of rattle me a little bit maybe it's because of you know the things that i believe in but one thing that scares me more than any other more than paranormal more than even like uh horror sci, -sci horror is real people because real people can be absolutely horrific to one another. I mean, you look at things like terrorism, you look at uh, things like torture or, you know, even, even things like gang violence. I mean, people, real life people can be absolutely horrific to one another. Now, this movie that I'm going to talk to you about in this episode deals with real people. Now, there was a little, a little game of you know, teasing going on throughout the week. We, we offered you a couple hints of the movie that I was going to be talking about. Now, first there was, there was one hint. There was one eyeball. And the second hint was two eyeballs did this purposefully because this movie is actually so well known that any other hint beyond those two things probably would have given the movie away. And I didn't want to do that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to share with you one more final hint. Now, for those of you watching it, here's the full picture. This is the picture that shows the full person who those eyeballs belong to. Do you recognize who that is? No? Okay. How about this? And this is going to be for the audio only listeners. How about this? Maybe these sounds will, will trigger it for you. Sure. 
sound familiar? I'll bet some of you are probably going, ah, oh, yeah, I know what that is. Some of you may already know. We'll let it keep going. Still nothing. All right. <laughs> That's enough for that for now. So I'll tell you, in this episode of My Horror History, I'm going to be talking to you about, like I said, this movie, when I first saw this, again, remember I was a kid, we were back at the drive-in theater. I talked to you guys about that in the last episode about how uh, back when we would see these movies, typically we would go to the Dixie Cruise in, uh, you know, and it would be at nighttime, it would be dark. Often me and my brothers and sisters and other kids, we'd be up at the playground, you know, hanging out, watching these movies. This movie was one, like I said, I'll, I'll never forget first seeing it. And I was absolutely, this movie shook my soul literally when I watched it now some of you may have seen it later and you're like eh. but again you got to remember this movie was pretty much first in class and it was the first movie of its time that I'd ever seen like this I'm of course referring to the 1974 classic the Texas Chainsaw Massacre brought to us by the late great Tobe Hooper, who passed away on uh, August 16, 2017, at the age of seven or 74, he went on to bring us Texas Chain. He brought us Texas Chainsaw Two in 1986. Now, I really didn't care for that, but that touches on something else that I I often talk to people about. I don't tend to really care for sequels and remakes. However, you know, in the last episode, I talked to you about Damien, the Omen, and how those sequels. I enjoyed those but then again that story warranted sequels it was it was that that whole story of Damien could only be told in sequels otherwise we couldn't you know they couldn't encapsulate the whole uh, the, the the whole storyline of the Antichrist uh, unless they broke it up into three movies otherwise it would have been about six or seven hour long movie who's gonna sit through that right <laughs> but uh, the chainsaw sequel it didn't really do anything for me he uh, uh let's see tobe hooper he he went on to do a couple episodes of the tv city uh, series freddy's nightmares I, I don't i don't think i ever really watched any of those i may have watched one and i i just i moved on uh he did do a couple episodes of a show that i used to like uh back in the day called salem's lot and it was a pretty creepy show uh some, some great stuff going on and on you know going on there and he did many other films and tv tv shows but this movie texas chainsaw massacre this was the one that put toe hooper on the map as being one of the kings of horror uh he was he was assisted in writing by uh by kim hinkle uh he helped with the screenplay he also did leatherface texas chainsaw massacre 3 in 1990 he did texas chainsaw massacre the next generation in 94 he did texas chainsaw in 2013 and more and again uh it, it, for kim it seemed like he was just essentially milking the franchise but again you know you you do what you gotta do right you do what you know, you focus on what's making you money. But again, for for me, all of those, they lacked a lot. I, I just didn't care for it. Uh, because here's my thing with sequels. The best way I can put it, I look at it this way. A great story only needs to be told once. A great story doesn't need multiple sequels to continue on, to continue on, to continue on. Because a great story stands on its own. Sequels, in my opinion, come across as exactly what they tend to be they're cash grabs and in my opinion that cash grabbiness if you will it, it comes across uh, and the stories tend to be you know it got to the point where chainsaw almost became comical you know and i think for a lot of people it was and, and i think to this day a lot of people look at it that way some people like the fact that it's almost so corny and campy that that's what they love about it but this first one that's not what this was all about this was a story of five young people, Sally and her brother Franklin, 
they were going to check on their father's grave because at the beginning of the movie we see these these shots and that's those sounds you hear in that sound clip that I, I play for you. There's these there's these shots of these dead bodies. Uh, there's these you know and it's like a, a, a police flash of a, there's a flash cube going off is what it is. You know at first it seems like that's the police taking pictures but we find out later on that's not what that was and it pans on out to a view of a couple bodies perched up on a gravestone in a kind of weird way almost like someone was trying to make some sort of art. Now Sally was played by Marilyn Burns who passed away in uh, August 5th 2014 uh, it was reported as a heart, a heart attack, but I don't know if, if anything else was found uh, found out about that. She did go on to do Chainsaw the Next Generation in 1994, as well as the Texas Chainsaw in 2013. Again, I, I just didn't care for those. That remake of Chainsaw, it was good, but it, it was it was new good. You know what I mean? It was like they and they did try to stick stick pretty well to the original story. It was filmed. You know, nicely, nice new film. But another thing about, uh, for me, with remakes, a movie like this, one of the, the, the things that I love about this original version is the fact that the film quality isn't necessarily the best. You got to remember, this was back in the 70s, and this movie was shot on about a $30,000 budget. Now, keep in mind, it has since grossed over $30 billion worldwide. So it's 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 it continues to be a juggernaut because it is a cult classic. It is a horror classic, not even a cult classic. It is it is at the, the, the top of the line. So again, we have Marilyn Burns as Sally. We have Paul uh, Pertain as Franklin, her brother, who's in a wheelchair. We have Alan Denzinger as Jerry, who's Sally's boyfriend. We have Terry McMinn as Pam, and we have William Vale as Kirk. Those are. Their boyfriend or girlfriend, there's, those are the friends that come along with them to to go check on their grandfather's grave. Because what we find out is, like I said, there's someone that's going into the graveyard, this graveyard in Texas, and they're disturbing people's loved ones' graves for whatever reason. It's not even really grave robbery. Uh, so what we find out, the story picks up at the beginning. You know, they make their way there. Now, you guys may read some online synopsis synopses <laughs> synopsis synopses of this movie and i've read a few of them that say that on their way there the events that happened happen actually that is inaccurate what happens is the movie picks up they are already pretty much arriving at the graveyard they're going to check on their grandpa's grave they get there uh, they get introduced to the sheriff there and they get walked over and they you know, they confirm, yeah, your grandpa's grave is fine. The events that happen actually happen to them when they leave. You know, they've already gone down. They've checked on the grave. They found out everything's okay. So they're on their way back. Now, keep in mind, this is in the middle of a sweltering hot Texas summer. And I've never been to Texas, but what my understanding is, Texas summers are a lot like the summers we have here in Ohio. Hot, humid, hot, 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 humid, hot, hot, hot. That's the best way to put it. It is just hot and sweaty and hot. So they're driving along in their van. You know, they're just they're just chugging along. You know, they're 70s guys, 70s, you know, young people in their in their van. And their friend Pam, she keeps reading from this astrology book. You know, this was you know, this was kind of not that astrology has gone away, but this was kind of at the height where, you know, astrology was super, super popular at the time. And she has these books and she's talking about why this grave stuff is happening because this is in retrograde and blah, 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 whatever. Well, as they're driving along, they see a guy on the side of the road, a hitchhiker, and they decide, you know, it is so hot outside. We cannot just leave this poor guy. We got to pick him up. So they decide to stop and pick up this hitchhiker. Now, along the way, before they pick him up, they smell the smell and they look over, they notice these cows, you know, it's a, it's in the country, it's in Texas. And uh, Franklin starts going on and on about, you know, the slaughterhouse. He's like, oh, I bet that smell is coming from the slaughterhouse. And he starts talking about how, you know, you know, in the slaughterhouse, how they, how they slaughter the animals. 
you know, the girls don't really want to hear it, but he's like, oh, it's actually, it's actually pretty efficient the way they kill them. They use this, this gun thing and they shoot it up into their brains and they, you know, he starts describing how it's quick, efficient, and pretty much humane. So anyway, they pick up this hitchhiker, weird looking dude. Guy gets in, he's got this huge scar on his face. He has this open sore on the other side of his face and you know immediately everybody's kind of looking at him like okay this guy's uh this guy's uh not maybe not wrapped too tight and so they ask him they're like uh did you did you come from the slaughterhouse over there do you work there and he's like no i, I don't work there i i was over there though and he starts talking to this hitchhiker he, and uh, franklin franklin starts talking to the hitchhiker he's like man you you work that gun you ever see how they how they use that gun to slaughter the the animals and this guy immediately is like no man that's that's no good my grandpa worked at the slaughterhouse the old way is better you know taking a hammer blah blah you could tell he has some pride in the way slaughtering animals used to be so much so he pulls out some pictures these really gross disgusting pictures of these slaughtered animals and he's like yeah that that was me that's what i used to do i used to i used to help uh, help clean up blah 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 after after slaughtering is, is has taken place and he passes the picture around and they're like okay dude uh, that's enough of that we don't we don't want to see that so so you know they're driving along it gets a little it gets a little quiet because you know the guy is a little offended by by you know the fact that they don't really care for his little pictures In the meantime franklin's kind of sitting there picking at it picking at his finger with his pocket knife creepy guy creepy hitchhiker guy kind of gives this grin and he reaches up and he takes franklin's knife and he's kind of giggling the entire time and he takes it and he just gouges it into his hand and cuts this deep cut into his hand and he's laughing the entire time and they're all like dude what is wrong with you what's going on what is wrong with you and then he just kind of sits back kind of creepy like and he gives franklin his knife back in the meantime and then oh, then right after that he goes hey I, I got a knife and he he pulls out this little kind of looks like a razor blade actually for shaving and uh he's like here you can check it out check it out they're like no they do we're, we're, we're good we're good we, <laughs> we're all good so he he sits back again he's kind of looking like oh you know he kind of, he kind of looks a little, a little bewildered as if he wants to fit in with these young cool kids but he's not really fitting in so so he decides to pull out his camera and it's it's kind of a bigger old camera you gotta pull up the front part of the lens and he's pointing it around at him and then he takes a picture of him and they're like uh okay dude you know uh that, that, that's that's all right that's all right uh so you took our picture so he he he, he develops the picture it's kind of like a polaroid type of situation and he's like here it's a great picture it's a great picture and they're they're like no not really he goes well you can go ahead and pay me for it you can give me two bucks for it and they're like no dude we don't want your picture so he kind of frowns at him again and he's got his little like a little satchel on him so he pulls out some foil and what looks like gunpowder and he puts it on top of the pitcher and he sets it on fire and it's kind of a big fire everybody starts freaking out and screaming and that's it he's got to go they're like this dude has got to get out of the van so they kick him out he's laughing all weird and wicked and then he smears blood on the side of the van as he's running as you know they're driving off and then he does this weird dance in the middle of the street now one little goof in this movie is at that part after he smears the blood in, on the side of the van they show him dancing then they pan back to the van driving off and the, and the blood's missing but the, you know it's one of those one of those little what do you call it bloopers it was a cinematic blooper so in the meantime Pam goes back to reading her astrology and she's actually kind of annoying and they decide you know we, we better stop for some gas you know they got a long you know long drive back they go to stop for gas at this little, you know, local rinky dink gas station. They pull in. Uh, the girls go in. They get out of the van to go in to f uh, find some, some, you know, something to drink or whatever. Maybe use the restroom. Uh, what looks like the, the gas station manager or owner, he comes out. And they're like, hey, can you fill us up? And he's like, no, I don't have any gas. The truck doesn't come until maybe tomorrow, maybe later tonight. But you guys can stay here. I got some barbecue. You can hang out. They're like, no, dude, we, we got to go. We got we, we're in a hurry. We got to get going. So they're he, they're like, no. And he goes, no. Well, I'm sorry, you don't have, we don't have any gas. And plus, you don't want to be hanging around here with these girls. You know, they 
And, well, uh, actually, Franklin is like, you know, we passed a farmhouse back there. I think that's my, uh, my dad owns that farmhouse. And the guy's like, no, you don't want to go over there. You don't want to be messing around with other people's property. People don't like that. And, and he goes, plus, you don't want to take those girls over there. And they're like, um, no, never mind. Let's, let's just get going. We'll go check it out. They get the girls back in the van. And, uh, and they head on over to this farmhouse. So they get to the old farmhouse. Of course, it's all old and run down. It's overgrown, even. They go in. They're goofing off. Franklin's freaking out about this hitchhiker they had picked up. You know, he, he actually he invited he had invited them back to his house. Uh, they had had a conversation about head cheese. He's like, you know, you come back. My brother makes some great head cheese. We can have some barbecue. We can have some dinner. And they're like, no, man, we're in a hurry. We got to get going. So Franklin's still freaked out about this guy because he actually, when they went to kick him out of the van, he cut Franklin's arm with his razor. And Franklin's like, man, you think I said something that made him mad? And they're like, no, Franklin, don't worry about it. But when they got out of the van, they noticed that blood smear that he put on the side of the van kind of looked like some sort of weird symbol maybe so franklin's like do you, do you think maybe he's he's mad and he's gonna come after us and they're like no dude don't don't even worry about it just 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 don't worry about it so everyone else goes into the farmhouse and they're goofing off you know they're like i said you know they're walking around they're giggling they're making fun of uh sally's old room she shows them the old wallpaper you know franklin's in the wheelchair so he's down there outside by himself he's getting a little irate it's hot he can't, you know, necessarily roll through all the dirt and everything. He's pissed off. He stumbles upon this weird-looking pile of feathers and bones on the back porch. And then there's these weird bones hanging in the doorway back there as well. He's calling for Sally. He's like, man, can we can we please just go ahead and, uh, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm not having a good time. This, this is not a good time. Well, Pam and Kirk... Uh, they were like, well, frankly, didn't you say there was like a creek down there or, or a, like a, a watering hole or something? We, we want to go swimming and go cool off. They grab a blanket. He's like, yeah, it's just round back that, you know, just go down that way some. So they go and they take off. And they go to, uh, you know, maybe go get a little swim. So as they're walking back there, as Pam and Kirk are walking in the back, they hear the sound that sounds like a motor running. Kirk thinks, well, Obviously, these people, whatever this is that's running, there's some gas. Because remember, they need gas. They're, they're about to run out of gas. And the gas station guy told them he doesn't have any. So they follow the noise. Uh, and they, they find that there's a generator running in what looks like a field. Maybe it's running some sort of pump for, for watering the, 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 uh, the plants or whatnot. And they keep walking around. They find a, this... Uh, just looks like a canopy that's built over a bunch of cars and kirk's like wow and this this is odd and you know they look like cars that may have been recently put in there it wasn't like a car collection so oh well so they, they're walking around they're trying to see if anybody's available they go to the front door and they start knocking you know kirk's knocking on the door and this old tooth falls <laughs> and it hits him and he picks it up and he scares pam with it she gets mad at him and she walks on across the front yard and sits down in the swing in the meantime, Kirk's bamming on the door. Hey, you know, is anybody here in here? You know, can somebody help us out? And because it's a movie, like everyone does in movies, he goes ahead and decides to go ahead and walk in the house. <laughs> and he walks in. He's like, hello, is anybody in here? You know, somebody, somebody help me out. Well, there's a door towards the back of the room. He, you know, he's in the doorway and straight in front of him there's a doorway to another room and he can hear a, a, a little noise so he figures somebody's back there probably just hanging out doing something or whatever so he walks on back there and he's like hello hello is anybody here can you guys help us out you know we need some help and that's the last we hear from Kurt in the meantime Pam is sitting on the swing she's like what what is taking him so long? So she decides to get up. She's going to walk in there and see what's going on with uh, with Kurt. She's like, Kurt, come on, man. What's up? What's going on? You know, it's time to go. Let's go. What are you doing? And she hears this noise and she figures he's just messing with him. So she goes in and when she walks in, she she doesn't go through the door that where Kurt went in straight back because that door is now closed. Instead, she goes off into the left, which 
goes into what looks like is the kitchen of the house. And as she walks in this kitchen, she falls because there are bones everywhere and there's feathers everywhere. And there's a chicken hanging up in a cage. And then, you know, she's kind of shaking up. She's like, what in the world is this? And, you know, she's kind of like looking around and there's this, this weird bone couch. It's like a couch made. There's a regular couch, a bench, but there's these huge skeleton bones put all along it. And she just can't figure out what, what in the world is happening right now. And once she gets her senses about her, she kind of freaks out and she's ready to go. She gets up, she's kind of crying and screaming and she takes off. And right as she takes off is when we really get introduced to one of the pivotal characters of the movie, Leatherface. Voluntary Input is brought to you by Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast, make money doing it. Go to anchor.fm slash start to join a diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. Now, Leatherface is uh, played by a man by name uh, by the name of Gunnar Hansen. Gunnar's a pretty big guy. He went on to do some other movies as well. Pretty good, big guy, six foot four. Anyway, he grabs Pam, pulls her back into the doorway that he had taken Kirk through, and we're introduced to a meat hook. He takes Pam and he hangs her up on the meat hook. That scene alone. I remember sitting there watching that just made me cringe. I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) how did they do that? Because it looks like he really just picks her up and hangs her on the hook. And from that hook, Pam looks down and she sees what had happened to Kirk. He's laying out in front of her and Leatherface picks up the instrument that gives us the title to the movie. He picks up his chainsaw and he begins to go to work on Kirk. In the meantime, back at the van, Jerry's having a little bit of fun with Franklin. You know, he knows Franklin's freaking out about this hitchhiker they picked up. He's like, oh yeah, dude, he's coming for you. He's gonna come and get you. And uh, Sally's like, man, he doesn't even know who we are. And and, uh, Jerry's like, oh, yeah, I gave him your name, Franklin. He's going to come and get you. In the meantime, they're like, you know, it's getting late. You know, it's starting to, the sun's starting to go down. It's dusk by now. Uh, So Jerry's like, you know what, I'll go find him. And uh, we'll, you know, get everybody back together. You know, and at this point, I don't know what their plan was. They didn't really have gas. I don't know if they were planning on leaving, but... I I think the impression was they were just going to stay in this old house, which was Franklin's and Sally's dad's house. But, you know, there was no lights or electricity, but I guess they figured, you know, they could just hang out there until the morning when the, as the gas station owner said, the the tanker truck gets there and they can get some gas and be on their way. So Jerry heads into the direction that uh, Pam and Kirk had gone and he eventually makes his way to uh to the old farmhouse to the farmhouse where pam and kirk had gone into so he's knocking on the door too you know it's a screen door he's looking in and and uh he starts hearing like it sounds like someone is inside giggling and he figures it's just pam and kirk messing with him so he's like come on guys let's stop fooling around let's let's go back to the van you know let's let's get back together it's time to go back still no pam and kirk so he decides to open the door and he goes in as well and right as he walks in he goes straight back to that same door that Kirk had gone through because it's back open again and there's a wall of skulls animal skulls and he, he's looking around and he's like what in the world is going on in here so he walks over to the left as Pam had done because that does lead into the kitchen area and he notices big giant chest freezer and he hears this noise and then it dawns on him it sounds like a girl and he thinks it's Pam maybe he opens the freezer and there is Pam the next thing we know here comes Leatherface and of course Leatherface gets Jerry 
And then this is when we get a really good look at him. Leatherface has kind of a bewildered look on his face, like he, he's kind of freaking out a little bit. He, he looks out the window. He, it's like he's thinking, where, where are all these people? Where do these people keep coming from? What am, what am I going to do? You know, and he's killing these people. He's like, I, I, I got to, I don't, I don't know what's going on. You know, you can tell this guy's not all there. And then they show a good shot of his teeth. You know, he's obviously something that's just not right with Leatherface. I mean, obviously this mask he has on is some person's skin. So, yes, we know something isn't right with Leatherface. Well, the next thing we know it is dark. It is now pitch black. And Sally and Franklin are back at the van by themselves wondering where is the other guys you know where is everybody where did they go they're screaming for them come on guys it's time to go they're yelling for them yelling for them and they never hear anything back so Sally's like give me the flashlight I'm going I'm going you know there's a little tussle and confrontation about it because Franklin doesn't feel comfortable giving her the flashlight she's like well I'll leave without it he goes okay never mind I'm coming with you I'm coming with you and so they decide they're going to track across you know this field and whatnot towards the direction where everyone else had gone because remember earlier Kirk and Pam thought they were going to go swimming but that creek bed was dried up and they ended up at this farmhouse and then that's also where Jerry ended up right so they make their way back there they're struggling to get through pushing through pushing through you know there's it's like wooded area there's the thicket and Franklin's like come on now let's go push me push me Sally struggling pushing pushing and then he's like wait a second you hear that Franklin hears a strange noise next thing we know there's Leatherface again Sally stands frozen watching what Leatherface does to Franklin eventually she takes off running and she happens to notice there's this light in the distance Yes, it's the farmhouse where everyone else had gone. She takes off running, running, running. She makes her way to the farmhouse. She makes it to the back door. It's locked. She cannot get through there, so she makes it around front. She busts open the door. Leatherface is, you know, charging behind her. She slams the door shut. He starts cutting through the door with his chainsaw. And, of course, she's taking off trying to find someone to help her out. So she runs up the stairs. And she sees someone sitting in a chair. She thinks, help me. You know, she's screaming, please help me. Please help me. But it's grandpa. And she looks over and then there's the grandma who is nothing more than a corpse. And a corpse of a dog, which was probably their pet. But again, these these figures are positioned in chairs like they're just sitting there having a conversation. So again, she takes off again back down the stairs but no Leatherface has cut his way through and he's on his way up the stairs she takes off running and her only escape is through a window she jumps out of a window she lands she gets hurt she's laying there for a bit she finally gets her wits about her she's able to get up and start running again Leatherface is right behind her here he comes he's charging with this chainsaw and you can just hear this constant grinding and running of this chainsaw he's cutting through the thicket that she's crawling through running through eventually she she's still running she bumps her head on a tree and falls back classic horror movie move <laughs> she she's shaking up for a little bit just in time to get up he's right up on her now and she's still running running back to the road and eventually she makes her way back to the gas station that they went to where they were told there was no gas she runs inside and the 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 owner attendant or whatever he is he's like oh my gosh are you okay calm down calm down he sits her down and she's like screaming and crying he's like you'll be fine everything be okay don't worry about it he's looking out the door he's like there's nobody out there now you're fine you're fine and she's just you know she's so shook up obviously she's kind of cut up and everything so he goes i'll go get my truck it'll be okay it'll be fine so he walks away, he goes to get his truck. She's sitting there alone by herself. You know, there's music playing from the old man's radio. The barbecue that they had had earlier is over there cooking and she kind of looks at it. And 
she notices there's something peculiar about this barbecue, but she can't really, can't really put her finger on it. But you know, she's still kind of shaken up about what she's uh, just seen happen to Franklin, and you can only imagine what's going on in her mind, what, a, what must have happened to her other friends, and so she's, you know, just kind of trying to collect her thoughts. Then the old man pulls back up. He's got his truck. You know, maybe she'll be safe now. And he goes around to the passenger side, opens the door, and he brings out what looks like a blanket at first. But, but no, this is a huge burlap sack. She's like, what are you doing? And he tells her, don't, don't worry about it. Just, just calm down. It'll be over soon. It'll be over soon. So he tries to put this sack on her head. And of course she fights him. She's like, dude, no way. The scene was kind of kind of comical to me because, you know, he's this crazy guy and he's kind of laughing. He's got jacked up teeth and he starts smacking her around with a broom because you could tell for him in his own little twisted psychotic way. This is a little entertaining to him to torture this girl. So he's smacking her around with a broom and he finally hits her hard enough that he knocks her out. And she falls down, puts a gag in her mouth. He ties her up, drags her to his truck, dumps her in the truck. He gets in. Oh, wait. I forgot to turn out the lights and lock up. You know, he has the wherewithal to go back and turn off the lights and lock the door. Because, you know, in this country gas station in the middle of nowhere, he says, you know, uh, the cost of electricity will drive is enough to drive a man out of business. <laughs> so he does remember to do that. And along the way, he's like poking her with a stick. She's crying and he's laughing at her. But then, you know, he's so twisted. He's, he's laughing and then... Then he has this, he changes to a face of like, like he's, he's sympathetic and he's all, oh no, don't, don't do that. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Don't cry. It'll be all right. Then he starts at her again, poking her, laughing, laughing, laughing. It is the whole, that whole sequence of events is just twisted and Hooper does a great job adding some background atmosphere. There's some creepy kind of underlying, it's not even really music, just just sound and, and like I said the atmosphere of the way this movie is filmed it's grainy and it's it's creepy so the entire time she's in this truck you know we got this grainy creepiness and they finally make their way to as you guessed it back to the farmhouse she just got away from as they're pulling in guess who's in the driveway stumbling around the hitchhiker they had picked up the old man gets out of the truck and he's yelling at this dude and we learn that obviously they're related. And he says something that's pivotal to the beginning of the movie. Remember the graveyard shot, shots? And it sounds like someone's digging. And, and it looks like, like I said, it looks like maybe the police were taking pictures. But we just get these flash bulbs. Well, he tells hitchhiker, creepy hitchhiker, I told you to stop going in, out there messing around in that grave. And the hitchhiker dude says, man, nobody knows nothing. They didn't see me. And he goes, oh, yeah, they know about you. They've been talking about it. So that's when we learn that it's actually this creepy hitchhiker, crazy dude that has been going to this graveyard and just digging bodies up and making, quote, unquote, sculptures out of them. Super weird. Just super, super weird. So they finally get inside the house. He he crazy hitchhiker dude takes Sally, he puts her in a chair, and he ties her up, gets her nice and secure in the chair, and he pulls the sack off of her head. And then he kind of starts he looks, he's a little surprised, and he laughs in her face a bit, and he delivers one of another one of my favorite lines in the movie. He goes, I thought you was in a hurry. Because you remember when he, they, he had invited them to dinner, they were like, no, man, we got to get going. We, we're, you know, we got we to gotta make time. We got to get back. I thought you was in a hurry. <laughs> one of my favorite, one of my favorite lines of the, of the film. In the meantime, we see Leatherface kind of bumping around in the background. And we notice he looks a little different. He's got a, full of hair, a fuller head of hair. And the, the face that he's wearing uh, looks a little different. Uh, and hitchhiker guy goes, hey, let, let's, 
you know, it's it's almost time for dinner. Actually, the old man says, it's time for dinner. Go get Grandpa. Hitchhiker guy goes upstairs. They, he's like, come and help me bring Grandpa down. He drags the guy down the steps. In the meantime, Sally just kind of faints. You know, she just can't take it. it the whole family, they're, they're yelling at each other. And, you know, the, 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 the old man, he's kind of calling everybody stupid. You know, stop doing this. Stop acting like that. Blah, blah, blah. Sally just can't take it anymore. She kind of faints. When she comes to, she wakes up to, quote, unquote, family dinner. They're all sitting around the table eating. They notice she wakes up and they kind of look at her. And they start, they start in on her laughing taunting her taunting each other because they're they're just such it's uh, just such such weirdos is the best 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 way best way to put it uh they're going back and forth hitchhiker guys like you know you don't know what you're talking about yelling at the old man you're just a cook he's like i i don't take no part in killing and he's like yeah you don't do anything around here and then they're yelling back and forth and you know it's just a crazy family dynamic they're obviously just not all there and hitchhiker guy goes you know what i got an idea you always said grandpa was the best in the slaughterhouse let's let him have a turn which you know clues us off as to why all those newer cars were out there it's because they've done this before this is a family of cannibals they have been stalking trapping killing and eating people again that realization alone just totally shook me up when I first saw this movie. The fact that people could actually act this way, behave this way, and treat other people this way, kill somebody in this way, not let alone eat them. This just shook me to my core. <laughs> so, so they go and they're like, okay, we're going to get grandpa. We're going to give grandpa his turn. They, they pull him on around the side of the table. They try to, they put a hammer in his hand. They're shoving Sally's head down into a bucket. In the meantime, don't forget, she is screaming her head off. There is nonstop screaming throughout this entire, the, I swear the latter half of this movie was just Sally screaming. I mean, she tried to talk to the old man. She's like, you can please help me. You can tell them, tell them to stop. And that's when hitchhiker, crazy, hit, creepy hitchhiker is like, he don't know nothing. He, he's just a driver. He's just a cook. So they're trying to get this old half dead grandpa to hit her in the head. He finally gets a quote unquote good whack into the back of her head. Her head starts bleeding crazy hitchhiker dude he's fed up he wants to do it so you know in the meantime he's trying to wrestle sally around keep her down he's like give me the hammer right as he reaches for it she's able to get loose she finally gets away and she takes off running once she gets outside the sun has already started coming up so she's already been through this horrific entire nightmare night by the time she runs out by the time she gets outside it is already daybreak so now she has crazy hitchhiker dude behind her she has leather face behind her with his chainsaw hitchhiker dude catches up to her he's slashing a knife back and forth across her back she finally makes it to the road and she manages to run out just in time and there is a truck coming through looks like it's a uh, cattle truck it she gets cross hitchhiker dude looks up and gets just absolutely laid out by this truck he's done and it this scene really shocked me too because it really looked so realistic it looked like a real person actually got ran over by a truck in the meantime here comes leatherface he's still running the truck driver he gets out he's trying to help sally they get back in the truck leatherface is cutting the side of the truck instead of just taking off which I, I don't know why the driver didn't do this they climb out the other side on the passenger side door and they take off running the opposite direction Leatherface is running up right behind in the meantime another pickup truck just happens to be coming by you know someone just cruising by going on about their own business Sally is able to jump into the back of the truck 
and get away. Now, we don't know what happens to the semi-truck uh, driver. All we see in this scene is he runs off camera. I guess we can only use our imagination. You know, the camera pans back to Sally. She's covered in blood. She's screaming and laughing at the same time. She's happy that it is finally over. And then we get a shot of Leatherface doing his classic chainsaw dance. Like I said, guys, this movie was absolutely pivotal to the foundation of my horror history. This movie scared me like no other at the time. It shook me to my core. Uh, the biggest reason being, like I said, you know, other things scare me too. You know, paranormal movies can scare me. Uh, movies based on biblical accounts can scare me. But the fact that real events, real people, because this was based on a true story. Only, it wasn't. So Hooper based uh, serial killers Ed Gain and Elmer Wayne Hensley as the influence for Leatherface. Like Gain, who was also the inspiration behind Norman Bates and Psycho, Leatherface had a history of wearing women's clothes and uh, uh, mutilating bodies. So for many years, a lot of people thought this was a true story, myself included. There were all these rumors, especially back then, that Sally was somewhere in a mental institution still screaming. Now, how is it that Hooper managed to kind of convince people that it was real? He never said that it was based on the true story. But how? what was convincing was at the very, very beginning of this movie, we are introduced with this. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, in particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother, Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So without coming out and saying, based on a true story, that intro gave the general impression throughout the entire movie that this all was real but it was not which makes it all the more classic it was genius of hooper to include such an intro all right guys i want to thank you once again for tuning in to this chapter two of my horror history and please stay tuned for chapter three now, if you want to know more about Voluntary Input, just go to voluntaryinput.com. There you'll find all of our past episodes, present episodes, uh, past videos, new videos, and whatnot. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, if you got any questions, comments, show ideas, or better yet, if you would like to be a guest on the show, just select contact. We would love to hear from you. And also, while you're there, if you would consider supporting the show, just click on support the show right there on voluntaryinput.com and there you will be taken to our where you have two options you can support us through patreon and if you become a patron depending on your level of support you can get different levels of voluntary input merch also there you will find buy me a coffee you can support us by just buying one coffee or you can do a continual donation again thanks again guys for tuning in to chapter two of my horror history we'll see you on the next one Take care, guys.
Never forced, never coursed. Open discussions about things in life that matter to you most. From tech to TV, movies, and gaming, and everything in between. Visit voluntaryinput.com to subscribe, contact us, and find out how you can support the show. Catch new episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And be sure to join us every Friday night at 11 p.m. Eastern and Saturday night at 11 p.m. GMT for Weekend Chill, exclusively on Mixcloud.